one and all present here. My name is Yash Panjwani and today I'm going to be speaking about stage fright. To begin with, I have stage fright. I'm very nervous when it comes to speaking, performing in front of an audience. So you must be wondering what I'm doing up here. It's a pretty funny story actually. One day before I had to go up on stage to perform, I was going through these quotes. I googled how to get over stage fright. So I was going through these quotes and I came across this one by Anonymous. It said, the best way to conquer stage fright is to know what you're talking about. The best way to conquer stage fright is to know what you're talking about. So me being me, I thought, why not talk about stage fright? Then I would definitely know what I'm talking about. And that is why today, I'm on stage speaking about my fear of speaking on stage. You can see that. You can see it's some sort of an experiment. By the end of this speech, I'm hoping to feel more confident the next time I'm up here. I'm hoping to change that quote a little bit to read, the best way to conquer stage fright is to go up on stage and talk about it. Stage fright or performance anxiety is a feeling of nervousness one gets before a public speech, a dance performance, a recital, or a stage acting. It's that feeling of nervousness or anxiety that is aroused in an individual who has to perform in front of an audience or before a camera. A typical situation goes something like this. Finally, the day has arrived. The opportunity you've been waiting for is here. You've been practicing your lines for the audition and you feel you know and identify with the character. And as you go up on stage to face the audition panel, you clam up and you start to sweat. Your hands and legs start trembling, your heart is racing, stomach in knots, your mouth dries up and the words won't come out. What is going on? According to most studies, people's number one fear is public speaking. Number two is death. Death is number two. This means to the average person, if you go to a funeral, you're better off in the coffin than giving the eulogy. So we can divide stage fright into four parts, or the four A's, as I like to call it. And the first A is anticipation. Anticipation is the expectation of unrealistic and negative images of the performance. It includes all those hours you spend thinking, what if this happens, what if that happens, what if I trip while I make my way up to the podium, what if I forget my lines, what if I bore the audience with my speech. Personally, for me, I have two very contrasting images that come into my head when I think about myself up on stage. The first image portrays me giving an absolutely amazing speech. I am oozing with confidence. Each and every word leaving my mouth is loud and clear. The audience is loving me. They are laughing, they are having a good time, they are connecting with me, and to themselves they are thinking, this guy is a genius. And at the end of the speech, I get a standing ovation. Everything's great, everything's amazing. Well, the other image portrays me, a trembling version of me, reaching for the mic with beads of sweat trickling down my forehead. As I begin to speak, I stammer and I forget all my lines midway. I stand mute, staring at the audience who stare back at me wondering if I'll ever continue. That's right. I mess up on stage in front of my parents, my teachers, my friends, while it's all being recorded on camera, waiting to be uploaded on YouTube. <laughs> no big deal, right? The second A is avoidance. A person suffering from stage fright will avoid any activity that has to be performed in front of an audience. When asked to participate in any event, the answer is a simple no. There's no point trying to convince that person to grab the opportunity, as they won't even consider your request. If it is not absolutely necessary, avoiding a task is a fairly simple task. However, if you hold the position of a prefect at school or a manager at work, your post requires you to address a gathering sometime or the other. It's then that you're stuck and your mind becomes an encyclopedia of excuses. You try shifting your responsibilities to others and if you succeed in doing so, it won't be for long. In fact, avoiding it will only haunt you in the future in a much bigger way until you are left with no option but to face your fear. The third A is anxiety. It refers to the panic or the anxiety that a person experiences now that they have to perform on stage. 
The symptoms of stage fright and social anxiety are more or less the same. When the case of stage fright, it is more severe. The symptoms can be classified into physical and emotional, and I know these symptoms only too well. From experience, I would say that the emotional symptoms will take a toll on you before your performance, and the physical symptoms will take a toll on you while you're performing. The physical symptoms are manifestations in the body, like trembling hands, trembling knees, nervous sticks, nausea, uh, cold hands, cold sweat, and so on. And the physical, oh, sorry, the emotional symptoms, first, it's first hard to comprehend that there's no way out of the situation. A million thoughts go through your head, and each thought is about that one performance next week. What do I do? Where do I start? How do I do it? It's only once you start practicing in front of the mirror that you realize the reality of your situation. It was in the 10th grade when I first gave a proper speech in front of my class. It was part of our language project to deliver a 2-3 to three minute speech about anything you liked. So once I chose my topic, I began practicing in front of the mirror, which I surprisingly found difficult to do. I remember thinking to myself, if I'm finding it so tough to talk to my own self in the mirror, there's no way I can do it in front of a class. I mean, this was really bad. This wasn't even on stage. This was on that tiny platform that every class has. And um, the night before the speech, I hardly slept. Even in the morning, I had no appetite to eat. I was the fourth to speak that day, and I could not pay attention to the first three speakers because I was so worried about my own speech. For me, the scariest moment was, and still is, when they announce your name to say that you're up next. I remembered I was baffled as I made my way up to the podium or to the platform. And as I nervously introduced my topic, my hands and my knees began to tremble like crazy. I mean, trembling is an understatement. My legs were vibrating. I was holding a paper in one hand, I was going like this, my legs were going like this. I put my hand behind my back. When I continued to finish the speech, I felt rather embarrassed, but it was a huge relief after I was done. Another emotional symptom is feeling incompetent for the task. That feeling that I can't do it and I just don't have it within me. It's very important to get over this barrier and once you're past this, we reach what I like to call scary stage scenarios. The first one has to be tripping on your way to the podium. I don't know how you can recover from such a fall. It hasn't happened to me, hopefully it never will, but I really don't know how you can recover from that. The second one, is the impromptu welcome and thank you. I've done these quite a lot actually. Every time there's a guest who comes to speak, I am somehow asked either to welcome them or to thank them. And personally, I hate doing this. <laughs> I'm always about planning. I always plan what I'm going to say next and here I have to think of something really quick. And it so happened that once I was asked to welcome the three quiz masters for the event. And out of those three, two hadn't arrived and one was there, one is present, and I was asked to begin. And as I began to speak, I realized that I hadn't located the quiz master in the audience. My gut told me to look to the left side and every time I called out their name, I smiled at the wrong person. <laughs> it was only when I got back into the wings that I saw he was on the right side, sitting right in front. And that was really embarrassing. And finally, the last one has to be forgetting your lines. I'm sure everyone who comes here dreads forgetting your lines. We're coming to the final A, and that A is appraisal. It refers to the period of time after the performance where the performer looks back on how the activity was done. What went wrong, what went well, what you can keep in mind for the next time, what can I do differently. It's very important to sit down and analyze the situation. Evaluation by your teachers and friends are equally important. Sometimes you forget your lines, you forget your cues, and you improvise to cover up. And in your head you're thinking, oh no, I messed up. And many a time the audience doesn't notice. You know the script, they don't. And um, if the audience has some constructive criticism to offer, it's better to improve on those areas the next time. But if they have good comments, then it will do your confidence, a world of good. So why is stage fright so common? What happens to us when we stand in front of an audience? What goes on in our body? I'm going to quickly talk about the science of stage fright. The genesis of the problem is rooted in the flight or fight response first postulated by Charles Darwin. He tested this theory when he visited snakes in the London Zoo. 
Darwin tried to put his face close to a venomous snake that was ready to strike and stay calm. Yet every time it struck, he instinctively and involuntarily jumped back. In his diary he wrote, My will and reason were powerless against the imagination of a fear that had never been experienced. This process is natural. It has been an evolutionary advantage for human beings, but when it comes to stage fright or grossophobia, it impedes the speaker from delivering a stupendous performance. Unfortunately, our brains are hardwired in this fashion. When we're engaged in public speaking, our reputation is at stake. We, we can't control it, our reputation is at stake. And so in an anticipation for a presentation or a speech, the flight or fight response kicks in. And to produce this fight or flight syndrome, the brain activates two systems the sympathetic nervous system and the adrenal cortical system. And what the sympathetic nervous system does is that it stimulates the adrenal glands to secrete the hormones adrenaline and noradrenaline into your bloodstream. And what these do is they increase your blood pressure, your heartbeat, and they send messages to your muscles to stay alert. Simultaneously, the adrenal cortical system is also activated. A hormone known as ACTH is, um, is secreted from the pituitary gland and it does the same thing. It, uh, it once again it stimulates the adrenal glands to secrete adrenaline into your blood. And what this does is that it lets your or it sends a message to your neck and back muscles to contract, pushing your position into a slouch. This is the position of low power. And it is during this position that your eyes are dilated and your digestive system slows down to give nutrients to the body and this is the feeling of butterflies in your stomach. It would be ideal for me to end this speech with how to overcome stage fright, but I am afraid I cannot do so because I myself have not overcome it. But I'll leave you with three points that have helped me reduce my fear of talking on stage. And the first one is practicing as much as possible. And every time I have to come up on stage to perform, I make sure I practice at least three days in advance. I practice everywhere. I practice in front of the mirror, and the shah, the dining table. I practice in front of my parents. And I always, that's probably the scariest thing for me. <laughs> I've always found that their criticism is useful. And if you do this, the day of the performance would be just like one of those practices but on a bigger stage. Secondly, I discover that confidence is not something you're born with. It's something that comes to you after you made the jump. After the speech in 10th grade, my friends and I decided to do a parody for Talents Day. I was extremely nervous and the only reason I agreed was that if it was bad, we'd share the embarrassment. But we went ahead with the performance and people liked it. We, did, we got a lot of good comments and that boosted my confidence. And I can say that two years later now, I've been on stage more times than I've ever expected of myself. And to be honest, the more times I'm up here, the less nervous I feel. Lastly, I'd like to quote George Jessel who once said, the human brain starts working the moment you are born and never stops until you stand up to speak in public. Everyone is nervous. Even the most confident speakers are nervous, even if they don't admit it. Being a there's no point in being ashamed of stage fright. It's only natural to fear failure. While you can't control what happens on stage, you can control how you handle it. Stay calm, laugh it off if you can, and remember the old performing adage, the show must go on. I'll leave you with a quote by Mark Twain. He said, there are two types of speakers, those who are nervous and those who are liars. Thank you very much.